because of, of time difference and the difficulties of telephone communication, whatever, Ridley and I began this began a kind of a, a, a correspondence. I was dealing specifically, really, throughout all of that with Walter. And uh, it developed, I think it actually mutual, mutually developed almost into good fun. And it was so scary, it was almost fun. Which would be the sorts of conversations that a producer or a studio head would have with a director normally when you walk down to the set and say, well, what do you think? And remember, because par part of I felt my job during the shooting was to try to help everyone remember what we got into this in the first place for it. Because you're in the heat of battle and he's dealing with such extraordinary difficulties and actors who are so putting themselves out on the line that it's quite easy to forget what are the big thematic issues. So there was this constant toing and froing, for the most part by fax. I would look at a rewrite that came out of a rehearsal and I'd even have them issues in the night write him two pages about it, it would be faxed to him, and he'd read it, and he says, ah, oh, this is rubbish, then he'd write back a story to me, and I'd get his writing. And we had this really very intimate and very energetic conversation that took place transatlantically. I think it was at the very end that I put them all together in a book and bound it and called it Letters to the Front and had it delivered to him. And it does provide a kind of an interesting insight. I saw it as my job to keep fighting, to say, you are wrong, you are wrong if you do this. I don't believe people will like the character. I don't believe the plot makes sense. And if you keep fighting your corner, then eventually people will take it in. And so I would keep fighting. Ridley tended to have a reaction that was very much to do with the dynamics within a scene. He's got a kind of remarkable genius for knowing what, how a scene works. So he would look at it as the scene, how he was going to shoot it and how the emotions were going to play within that scene. Doug Wick and Walter Parks were both looking at the great story all the time. And uh, Walter was a writer himself originally, and sort of still is a writer, really. Very much sees these things. So Doug, Walter, and I would argue out, where are we going? Where, wh wh what are we planting for the, for the viewer? What expectations are we arousing? How are we going to satisfy them? How are our characters evolving? And then, of course, when it got to the set, then people would start to argue about it as well, because everybody knew the script was in play. People are constantly experimenting on how the script is written. Mm -hmm. So there are nuances in it that develop as Ridley sees the characters developing. The producer came up to me yesterday and he said, oh, no, no. coming from a coast, there's going to be some, uh, some rewrites for next week. So, uh, so I give them to you either tonight or over the weekend. So I say, fine. So I, this is, listen, I'm a professional actor. Just give me something and I'll do my best to interpret it. My main contribution during that period was reassuring everyone that the movie was going fine uh, and getting the lines and the, and the character and the piece working for both Ridley and Russell. We've had a lot of, a lot of difficult things on this film, right? This, our script is being operated by committee. And that is not the best way to do it. It's actually the antithesis of how you should make a feature film. Uh, detail and collaboration, absolutely, 100% yes. But at the end of the day, there has to be a captain of the ship. So we have a little bit of that going on. The positive end of that, though, is that every single person on the committee is absolutely into doing the movie. Every time we had one of these collisions, the scenes were better for it. Because, you know, both, both men were willing to give just enough to accommodate what the other needed. And there was always, through the early stages of the film, you know, a sort of battle to get each section shot and each section contained. And it was like a day-by-day -day process, really, where Ridley was, you know, reworking things on the script with the actors and working with the artists, working with us, to push the characters to points which they, you know, wanted to get them to. And I think that really became a part of what made the film so good, in a sense. I mean, I really do. I know that's all bullshit, usually, but I do, because having stood outside trailer doors and in rooms and meetings and listening to the, the way these guys sort of fought to, you know, make these characters real and make this story progress. I do my first month ever in Morocco, five weeks, and we'd built the Roman, I'd reckoned, chosen casbars, which are the houses of Oliver Reed, the slave boss. Then a village called ABH, which I've now used twice since then. ABH, which was would be the Roman arena in the provinces, where we'd see him earn his colors as a warrior in the, in the, in the arena. 
That was shot in Wazazat, um, which is just below the Atlas Mountains. Uh, and there's a, there's a hilltop town, which Ridley had looked at before. On G.I. Jane, we'd looked at possibly shooting a sequence near there, but because of restrictions, we, we weren't able to shoot there. We scouted several different countries, and um, Ridley loves Morocco, and he was very interested in the idea of shooting around Wazazat. What we found around Wazazat was an existing village where we could actually build this flea-bitten arena right into the side of an ancient Moroccan village. And uh, Arthur Max did such a beautiful job that when you went to the location, this kind of old arena built out of natural mud Moroccan bricks looked like it had been the side of this village for centuries. And that was a pretty amazing sequence there, really, because we had at one stage we had like 5,000 crowd there for the big crowd scene. And Maximus has become, you know, a gladiator of renown through this part of the province of the Roman Empire. And then we used the town as well, where the gladiators get brought through and all the red dyes dripping down on them. We used the town in these alleyways and stuff that overlook it. But that was our main set. We also shot in another place which became Proximo School, where first introduced the character of Oliver Reed. I think the appeal of Morocco is the uh, culture. I've shot now Black Hawk down there in, and in the town in Saleh, and now just finished uh, oh, a long shoot in uh, by the Kingdom of Heaven. The artisans are great, you know, they, they can build so it looks like real stone. I think we built almost 30,000 mud bricks using local techniques, local materials, and baked in the sun, simply mud mixed with straw, cast in a mold and left to dry. And that was the joy of that project, using the indigenous vernacular style of construction. Uh, and uh, worked very well. It melted right into the existing landscape. Very rarely do you have to worry about the weather. And you get amazing colors here, and you get moon sets. We get moon sets, as you've probably seen as you get onto the film set. You know, the moon is setting, and then the sun comes up on the other side, and then as you leave, the sun is setting, and the moon is coming up. And he was in a hard work there in the desert bussing everyone in to watch this m massive scene and they, don't, they can't even see what we're really shooting but they're getting them to cheer and shout Maximus, Maximus. <laughs> and really they can't see anything and never mind who Russell Crowe is and where he's doing in the scene. One more, thank you, one more. Action! Oh! And again in this scene, you know, we bring this sort of this dirty reality, this sort of, you know, the unpleasantness of of what people do when they're going to go and fight in an arena to the death, and they're not experienced fighters. That you're terrified, you're scared, and I think that was in the thing in there as well, and the brutality of this. Outside in, in the actual arena, we have 10 gladiators, all armored up, ready to go, big weapons, swords, axes, things like that. Outside in the pen, we've got 16 guys, eight pairs. One of them has their left hand chained to the guy with his right hand. The guy with his right hand free has a sword. The guy with the left hand free has a shield. They come out into the arena with a crowd shouting for blood, and the 10 guys in the center are just try and decimate the guys coming out. They just have to try to survive. These things are dangerous, especially because the way I choreographed took a couple of days to choreograph and then a week or so of rehearsals to bring it up to speed with all the, with all the stunt guys. You work it slowly, you build it up very slowly over the, over the first couple of days, you start to put the speed in. Some of the weapons will be rubber if it's particularly near the fingers and things like that, so you use rubber weapons. Most of the time you try to, to use the metal weapons so it, it feels more authentic. 
Um, and you just have to try, especially with so many of the guys actually fighting very close to each other. You just have to rely on everyone knowing what they're doing and that the, the rehearsals have gone well, the choreography is good, and, and everyone's in the right position. A lot of technique in fighting and, and remembering which way you started and it is not only that you that there are two guys who are fighting you have actually uh, 20 30 people fighting to the same time and then you have the audience you have 2,000 people even in Morocco in the arena are screaming and shouting at you and uh, the doors opened and we right away got attacked so you have your fight and some um, some special effects, you know, there are some explosions coming up, coming up and, and, and blood is uh, uh, <laughs> all over the place. As you run through with Jaiman in front and you following, then you swivel like that, don't you? Then what, yeah, yeah you do, because you're here, Jaiman's here. Then what happens is you split, because Jaiman got to there, then he came to here. Yeah, but that does that. That move there shouldn't happen. Okay. We get to here. So yeah. Yeah. And we go to there. Right. And then we move together like that. <laughs> Ridley does love that sort of closeness and everybody in there really getting in and into the dirt and your face rubbed into it. I mean, he wants that kind of feel to it. So that's where it becomes quite tricky because you, you, you are, it's even more risk because of the way he wants the fights. And, and it's good in a way because it looks much better on screen. The thing is, unfortunately, there's slightly more risk inherent with it. Russell is very good. He picks it up very quickly. Um, he's very physical. I went to Australia to start with, spent a couple of weeks with him rehearsing out there. So we were just going through the basic movements out there, getting him used to the sword and how he moved. But luckily for us, he's a very physical guy. So he's got a very good memory. So he learns the moves quickly. See, three is funny because you've got a third one. Yeah. It's going okay, but then you need another three to get the one that we're Why not start like that and start working like that? Start yeah, and I think instead of cutting, if we get to the end where it's not NG, work back, just go back and just keep going. Do the magazine yeah. runs out. <laughs> and that's where we get the sword up, through the head, over you go, and smash. Russell is a pretty intense guy, so the guys around him have got to be really on the ball because, you know, he is going to go for it. You know he's going to go for it straight off. Uh, as long as he sticks to the moves, everyone's okay. He comes out and he doesn't hold back. He's swinging, but he's swinging and he's holding the moves. He's, he's, he's doing the moves. He's not hitting anyone with them really. So he's, you know, he's swinging them really big, but he's actually making the, the misses work. I think the pull away is good. It was good. Yeah, that was good. Because you responded up, to me. That's everything cool. up until that time was good. Yeah. But after that, yeah. he fell back. That's what I, I uh, came in one move too early, right? Yeah, yeah but that's uh, kind of okay because I still caught you. Your axe. Yeah. If I'm the ground, but the reason I'd have been there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if he cool. wasn't on the ground, he would have been there. Yeah. Do you want to take your hat off? Cool. Yeah, right. Cool then, right? Yeah. We've got a couple of minutes then. Yeah, take, 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 take it off. Just take the hat yeah, off, please. Give these guys a break. Every time, hats off. It's yeah, a fresh air, evil. We used for close up real weapons. I mean, if you miss someone, your finger is gone or you have a big cut in your arm. When we started rehearsing, one of the guys got a wooden sword and we were starting to rehearse with wooden swords to make sure everyone's in the right place. One of the guys got his head cut open, switched up and I mean, you're always going to get that sort of every day you're going to have an injury somewhere, but hopefully they're very minor and if everyone's on the ball, they'll be, you know, the smaller they'll be. you're on a sand base, you have metal weapons in your hand, you're chained to someone else, all it needs is, is someone in the wrong place, a tug, the hand moves, and someone's hit your arm. So, you know, it, it is really a case of getting the choreography really, really well down, so that the guys are really on the ball every time. They have to, they have to concentrate every time they come out. It's no good sort of saying, right, we've done it 10 times today, we're okay. Every time you come out, you've got to concentrate, otherwise there is potential for somebody to get very badly hurt.
jamming got hurt. I'm fighting with this guy who has a, a helmet, you know, with a horn and a, quite a sharp horn. And I, you know, I go in and, you know, knee him and uh, elbow him. And while I'm elbowing him, he's he was he was getting up and turning around like that. And when he was getting up, turning around, he turned around with his head, and um, the horn of uh, the helmet that just went through and got my shoulder and cut deeply. Hit myself. Hit yourself. <laughs> yeah, it's the uh, the, the, the nose. Yeah, the nose. Yeah. The Luckily, hey, I don't know. No, you don't know. I'm a gladiator now. Jamin came at this film, and there were no scenes written really, except him fixing his wound at the beginning. And gradually, Jamin had developed into a very nice little through line on that, of talking about afterlife and the importance of that. And so that's how Jamin, Jamin literally developed that character throughout the film into a very useful character. So at the end of the day, he has the last word. I had done a little film on a tank there called White Squall. And uh, I remember going one lunchtime, entered this ruin, and I walked in further to found this complex of enormous walls. And then beyond it was a barracks and a parade ground of Romanesque architecture and infrastructure. And I always remembered that and said to Arthur, you know, there's this place, something that he knew about, which it was an abandoned military fortification, I think which dated from the, originally from the 17th century, with 18th, 19th, and 20th century additions. I think it was last used as a barracks in the 1950s by the British, and has an architectural style which, although isn't truly ancient Roman, is more Napoleonic, but we felt was close enough to ancient Rome for our purposes, and really gave us 50% of our sets. Our set pieces in relation to existing buildings or within existing buildings. Terry Needham, you know, the um, first AD is the associate producer with Ridley and Ridley had always seen this place, you know, this old Napoleonic barracks and when the film came in to production, I think, you know, they said, well, let's go and head over here and look at this place and, you know, it became an amazing sort of central piece for the, um, our set in um, Gladiator. I think Troy stole it later and used it as well in Troy. In the center of this Napoleonic fort, they built pillars. We built one third of the Colosseum. We built, you know, barracks of the Rome barracks of Proximo, uh, where he keeps his gladiators. And we built the palace, the imperial palace of the Emperor Commodus. And it became like our oh, studio backlot set. You know, I mean, we shot, you know, virtually most of the movie in that in that location there. When we finally met our production deadline and the uh, crew arrived on Malta after having filmed in Morocco. Uh, there were certain script changes that were ongoing, which made it uh, difficult for them to shoot the sets that were originally scheduled to be ready as planned. We hadn't gotten the end quite right. We were changing some key scenes. So Ridley would have to step back from all the extras, the tigers, whatever, the unbelievable logistics, and step into this little tent where we would be waiting with a writer and we're trying to figure out some key turns in the third act. Um, 
and very stressful for the actors because sometimes they would get new scenes the night before they were going to work and then incredibly stressful for the production design because let's say the scene required some new setting in the palace that we didn't have so they were scrambling for the next day to dress some bedroom in the palace when i was on the location people would come to me designers would come to me and say is such and such a set ever going to be used and i would say no i'm not writing anything for it but we've built this you know what are, what are, what are, it is happening and i'd say well this and they'd say we haven't built that you know and is that going to happen and I would say, I don't know, I'm not the boss. I can tell you what I'm writing, but check with the boss, you know? <laughs> um, very, very disturbing to be working like that. There was a reluctance to shoot the sets that happened to be ready, and a request was made for us to have the sets that were originally scheduled to be shot last, ready first, which included the largest sets, i.e. the Colosseum, and the Imperial Palace. This is the nature of epic filmmaking. So the decision was not to shoot any of those sets at all, but instead to shoot night sequences. There was a lot of wear and tear, but Ridley was so unflappable in the center of that. And you might say he's the great multitasker. He was actually able to step outside, deal with the extras, the tigers, the logistics, the light, come back in, refocus on something he was going to shoot in two weeks, which was part of the end of the movie, that kind of focus, and then step to the next problem, uh, which was maybe a really pissed off actor who didn't understand why those lines that they were going to shoot uh, in three hours had just been changed. Like every time, you know, we got a new rewrite, it was sort of like, no, Ridley, please, please tell him we, we want that back. Please, you know, tell him we, we love that part and whatever. And he was so, so always trying, you know, just always trying to, to make it happen. With this big confrontation, it would be better than you have a farm rather than a taste. It, 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 used to be, it used to be the Carthage battle wasn't the, the um, uh, him revealing himself didn't follow the Carthage battle, right? And then we switched it. And so now I can't go, I can't wear the toga and then hack the statue in a completely different thing. You always say that when you make movies that it's um, nice to have the script all tied up and locked off and ready to go before you step anywhere near, even on the first day. And that so rarely happens. In this instance, this was certainly not locked up the day before I got on the set. But I think what happens when that occurs is you really, really pay attention to everything that you're doing and every step you're taking. And the organic effect of decision now, what will that mean later? And I think what came out of it was what seemed to be a seamless movie. And uh, maybe mainly because for the most part, there was you know, a few people really paying attention. The most impressive part about Malta was that Ridley had done the inside of the palace completely different from the way anyone else had done it. He'd done it almost like a cave. It was dark, where the lamps had been burning, there would be you know, ash in the walls, and you know, the slaves hadn't quite been able to get off. And you really had this oppressive feeling. And it probably was accurate. Our palace would come there in the morning, and there'd be, we'd like be halfway through makeup and, and, um, and, and costume, and, There'd be nothing there. There'd just be like this extraordinary open halls that they had created, marble halls that were so beautiful with light streaming in from the right sides. And then we'd like say, so where would you like to enter? And where would you like to start the scene? How would you like to start it? And again, this freedom. And then when we came back, he would have arranged all of the furniture, all of the props to fit exactly what we had in mind when we were doing the scene. The Colosseum set, as built by us, is a full-scale fragment of the original Colosseum, as close as we can reckon from research. It's an accurate reconstruction of the first tier only, and only a about a third of that. It would have been 
12 times bigger, three times as high, and four times as big around. The movie was probably not makeable at a price with most filmmakers. Where Ridley's extraordinary is well before we started shooting, Ridley had the whole movie in his head. So we started to look at creating the Coliseum, which of course we could only afford to do basically one side of it. Ridley was able to storyboard the whole movie such that he always knew which way he was facing. And he could always shoot into the one part of the stands that we built. And occasionally when you had to reverse, you could green screen and put something else in there. But you had to limit those shots because that becomes prohibitively expensive. The other challenge, of course, was you can't afford to have 50,000 extras. Five is expensive. And we'd have occasionally days of 5,000 extras. And then you'd obviously have to design in advance the shots so you're shooting at your extras. And then, of course, you take uh, plates of those extras and then you fill them in when you create the wider shots of the whole Coliseum. Using models, really, you know, with a, you know looking down like for a model and for a thing. I remember watching them do it, going, God, these blokes are cleverer than me. They, you know, they, they constructed, well, we can build this and build this and we can shoot this way and then we do cheated reverses all the time. I could make this senator's box the double of the royal box, so when I'm in the royal box shooting, I can take the royal personage Commodus, put him over here and flop this and make this a senator's box. So I can flip flop. I am always doing that, cheating the sets. So I'm doubling the scale immediately. So <clears throat> we're cheating all over the place. And um, so you just get this impression of huge scale. You know, flopping it around and cheating positions of people so you look back into the, the section of the set we had. You know, we change extras and the Vestal Virgins would be here, so if we went back, no Vestal Virgins, there'd be non-Virgins there. 